I'm going to find myself a girl who can show me what laughter means. And we'll fill in the missing colors in each other's paint by number dreams. And we'll put our dark glasses on and we'll make love until our strength is gone. And when the morning light comes streaming in, we'll get up and do it again. Amen. Get it up again. Amen. If you don't have hope, you got nothing. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do with my art is, is bring a sense of color and fun and uh, positivity in an era where we really, really, really need it. It became a real kind of a philosophical point of view from 70 on. I don't want to just have the life my parents had. This is not how I want to carry this forward. I'm not going to get a job and have two kids and live in the suburbs. Made a conscious decision. It's like, I'm going down this path. So he's going from here to, to Bethel? To Woodstock. To, Wood so to, Wood to the town. To the town of Woodstock. Which people think is, you know, the poor people. A lot of them do. They were disappointed in 69. They continue to be disappointed mm -hmm. in 2019. Just off the people who live in Woodstock. <laughs> There's a really interesting book called Small Town Talk all about the town of Woodstock. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I, I've been to Woodstock a number of times. I didn't really know that much about it. But to read it all from the, the towny perspective, I was like, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> all this stuff went on there. Meanwhile, I flew to Boston to say farewell to my old Berkeley sister, Peyote Blossom. Who was really saying goodbye to me? You know? I mean, you can just—you can be anywhere, man. You, you are just in your in your place. Joe and I had plans, but at the time we were broadcasting that. As many people who were at Woodstock, there were you know, millions more who didn't get to Woodstock. And it wasn't really until the film came out that you had this sense of wow. This was amazing, that there was this sense, forget the mud, forget the rain, forget the lack of food, but it was just this amazing sense of, God damn it, I wish I'd gone to this thing. What became of the changes that we waited for love to bring? Were they only the fitful dreams of some greater awakening? I believe in the time going by. They say in the end, it's a wink of an eye, and when the morning light comes streaming in, We'll get up and do it again. I mean, it's weird being interviewed in Australia explaining how I felt returning to America after living in Australia for two years, right? But coming home in 2019 after a long time of being away, everything was exactly the same as I left it, except slightly worse. That people are like, oh, my world's fine, like everything's fine, the sun comes out, and the birds are turning, I was like, yeah, but it, things are fucked up and they just, I don't think people, I, I don't think most people seriously think that things are as fucked up as they are. I think they're just, they're going to be fine. It's not like it used to be, but nothing is. And I remember when the guy was um, filming me. Oh, uh, so when you were making the call, you remember the camera guy being there? Yeah, I remember I was like, oh, I just want to get this call over with. Why are you bothering me? <laughs> Little did I know that that was going to be something that I would love for the, my whole life. My parents said, make sure you call us to tell us you got there, okay? As you can see in the movie, I couldn't get through. <laughs> Monday morning, I go back to school. Everybody goes, you're in the movie, you're in the movie. Yeah, I said, really? Yes, I've been coming here since like I was 13 or 14. And one day I said, let me take a walk down one block to see if there's really a park there. And that was the beginning. And maybe we were young and a little more innocent and naive um, in those days. But, um, you know, things are what they are now. But I'm glad I got to live through Woodstock, first of all. And the question being, what does Woodstock mean to you? I have no idea, honestly. A tremendous concert. Too bad that vibe isn't still happening anymore. I just think of a bunch of happy people partying together and listening to music. Well, I think it's interesting. It's perceived as a very... Um, uh, anti-capitalist affair, but the thing is, its most direct descendants now are the capitalist machinery of festivals that we are currently participating in. 
I mean, that is sort of the dreams of all young people is like you'll be able to run away for a week and go to a festival in the desert. And it really doesn't seem like an answer. It seems like this sort of escapist fantasy of festival is in fact another vector through which we can be trapped into our lives. The 2019 vibe was reminiscent of that 1968 lurch to the right. Our tribe was buzzed about the Woodstock celebrations for sure. But outside of that dream, history sets the tone for the present. That felt pretty heavy. And this was the world before January the 6th, before George Floyd, before COVID. Maybe history wouldn't have to repeat itself if we listen once in a while. But hey, outside that womb, the establishment saw to it that Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. got shut up with bullets. That sense of community kind of shattered in 68. There was no joy in it. It was bleak, it was dark. The fun was over. The shit hit the fan. Nixon got elected. God help us all. They pumped up the draft. What the hell is going on? It just seemed like the Nazis had taken over. Kind of like today, you know. My downer on Reagan's presidency is less about his love for pre-industrial America, you know, when only white male property owners could vote, less about his brown shirt policies against hippies, but rather that we totally failed to learn anything from his presidency. We could all see where it was going. That's why I favored legislation to end the practice of abortion on demand and why I will continue to support it in the new Congress. At least he was a genuine asshole, unlike Trump, who's a make-believe asshole. He just did exactly what I assumed he was going to do, just made things dark. Money, drugs, and distraction was a three-pronged war against the counterculture. Starting with Nixon, accelerated through the 80s. A lot became addicted to the lethal drugs being pumped into communities, either through prescription or the streets. Jerry Rubin devolved into a total sellout. And arcade games went from pinball to pong to killing aliens from your comfy couch in like, you know, 10 years. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. The Pong arcade game is interesting. Some people see simulated table tennis, but I see politics. You got left, right, divide, a middle line in the sand, a dot as a metaphor of opinion, back and forth until the score is settled and win it declared. I mean, come on. The jump from Pong to the virtual murders of humans and aliens, I don't see as a particularly big jump. Now you realize the Pong arcade game has been the tool of choice for selecting our president since 1972. Mm -hmm. America's brave new world began when Nixon defeated McGovern in a single Pong game, 11 to 8. If that were true, the result could not have been worse. The hippies were a genuine counterculture, and the culture hippies were rejecting pushed back with force. See, most hippies were privileged white kids. That alone was enough to inflame the sensibilities of everyday Americans. Black, brown, or LGBTQ activists would never have gotten away with the transgression the hippies did for as long as they did. But when the establishment saw hippies burning draft cards, that was too much. That was treason a spit in the eye to the war generation, they had to be stopped. George Harrison said his take on the 60s, what it was, it was like the Italian Renaissance, except it happened in 10 years. But so much happened, so much change, so much impact. From 1960 to 1970, it's like, how can this even be the same world we lived in, you know? The Woodstock generation as it actually unfolded was so troubling and strange that once Vietnam's struggle was over, Neoliberalism and global capitalism did its best to remove all traces of the truth. And it became predictable to portray hippies as fried, free-loving, peaceful potheads. The truth is way more complex, and a lot less funnier than Cheech and John. Dave's not here! So by recasting the Woodstock generation as deadbeat sellouts, generations of Americans dismissed the warning of the 60s uprising that the real threat to our liberties comes not from without, but from power structures within. The years that followed became defined not by peace and love, but by neoliberalism and global capitalism. I mean, the 60s were only crashed when John Lennon got shot. Our radical hippie counterculture transmuted and became this lovable subculture. Turned into 
to a lame duck, and American politics was lurching further to the right. By the time Harvey said, Can we go somewhere with no guns? I said, How about Australia? Australia's only got a few guns. She said, Far out. And we went there. See the real thing, come and see the real thing. The first crash pad in Australia was Bruce Watson's commune farm. Bruce introduced us to some groovy types who turned us on to a regional 60s state called The Real Thing. We recorded it and hit the road as the trip. The Real Thing was this little time casual. Like you travel, you know, time travel from 1969 to sing about Donald Trump. Or any president, really, dating back to LBJ. Which tells you how long America's been putting up with this bullshit. Donald Trump was just another facade to suit. The new snake oil salesman on the block. And the real thing? Like a genuine leader? Well, they get shot, don't they? So that song was really timeless to us. It never charted in America, so when I heard about it, it sounded like some lost recording of the small faces. I flipped a wad over the real thing, right? Meanwhile, the media was flipping its wad over Trump's carnival barker twist on patriotism, which convinced enough Americans he was the real thing. I think it did. Good TV. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Good TV. Watching daily Trump updates felt like being there, so I stopped tuning in. It was the opposite of flower power. Let's do things guaranteed to lose our minds. Let's hate beauty. Let's love ugliness. Any passive resistance or nonviolent ideology was like nowhere, man. You know, it, it speaks to the era we're in now, the Trump based. That mass of morons is always out there. They're always there. It's like, see, I told you. I told you, asshole, this guy was a jackass. We fucking told you. You know, so, and so it was like, I was like, so like, ha. Huh. America's daily nonsense is an ongoing symptom of November 1963, the day America lost its mind, and it's still lost because America can't agree on what it looks like. My grandson, who's 23, is terrified. Like, actually depressed about the state of mankind, the planet, and all the millennial kids I know. They just feel helpless. I think my art is, is a, a reaction against all of that. I'm finding hope and joy and pleasure and color and in Stardust in my art. Uh, I started doing psychedelic art again about 10 years ago. Could I have stayed in the land of Oz then? Yeah, maybe. If it wasn't for the Woodstock celebrations, I may have. The rest of the band sure wasn't interested in coming to the States with us, but you know, I didn't take it personally.